What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Core Consults RX podcast. Cole and I are joined with a special, special guest, Dr. Jimmy Pruitt from the Farm So Hard podcast. Jimmy, what's up, man? That's my super excited to be on. I feel like this has been a long time coming and it's just been amazing to get to meet you guys and get this thing going. Yeah. I appreciate it, man. Now, it's, it. We've been talking about this for months, right? And then it's been, a lot of it was me forgetting to message back and then that, you know, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, I'm glad we can finally do this. You know, it's been a while since we had another uh, fellow podcaster on as a guest. I guess it was, um, it's probably been since Rich, right? Oh, yeah. Uh I guess so. And even back to the beginning with Adam, like one of our first few episodes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's been a minute. minute. Yeah, because usually we'll have guests that are like, you know, the healthcare providers, but not actually have their own podcast. So definitely, we'll we'll tag his podcast, Farm So Hard, um, in uh, the show notes and stuff. So make sure you check that out if you don't already. Um, Definitely a a solid one. So Jimmy, man, how? uh, Give us a little origin story about you. Um, How did uh, you know you come about and starting your career and all that good stuff? Absolutely. So I'm originally uh, originally I'm a student athlete. So I got lucky and had someone tell me, hey, you should think of something else other than football. And I was like, I'm going to NFL. (laughs) That's my deal. And I just got lucky and went home one day, watched the episode of house. And it was, well, my homework assignment. She's like, what do you want to do? I was like, I guess I'd be a pharmacist. You know, I like drugs. I'm good at science. I'm good at math. I'm like, I'm going to do this. And I spent my entire undergrad, you know, figuring out what program I would go to to play football. And that's a pharmacy school. And I was lucky to go to Presbyterian college down in Clinton in St. Clinton, South Carolina. And it really just, confirmed my interest and when I went there and went from, you know, there to Advent Health Orlando to my PGY one program and then went to Grady, which is like my dream PGY two for mm-hmm. emergency medicine and it's just been great. Cool. Nice. Talk a little bit louder. Right, perfect. There you go, perfect. <laughs> what um where'd you go to undergrad? So undergrad, I went to Presbyterian College as well. Okay, so you stayed there for pharmacy school. Nice. Yeah. Oh, so you went there to Presbyterian for undergrad, and okay, and that's yeah. cool. You How know, was that transition period being at the same school? It was it was pretty cool because it's like a completely different set of people. So again, when I was there undergrad, I was an athlete. Yeah. So, and then when I went to pharmacy school, it's like, oh wait, weren't you the guy that played football? It's like, yeah, you know, this is why I'm here. <laughs> so it was a pretty cool thing, and just being able to have the Clinton's not a very busy city, right? So. Not much to do, so it really did well for staying focused and you know doing what you need to do for school. So you were uh, part of the Blue Hose football team. Oh, go Blue Hose! What man. what what is is it hose like pant like yeah pantaloons? They they could have did us they could have did us better. Like, <laughs> I you have, feel like, the like red that socks. could be misinterpreted. Oh God! <laughs> Trust me, every so it wasn't a very you know winning program. So uh-huh. he, unfortunately, I remember this guy consistently saying, "Come on, Hubble Hose, you playing like some hoes right now." No. <laughs> <laughs> and I just like every time I would get so upset and like, "Why did they pick this name they for?" They had it? to see that coming. I'm sure it, I'm sure it's an old thing. I'm sure yeah. it's old. You know, I also um I remember watching House in high school and it piqued my interest in medicine too, which going back and watching now, you know, of course it's <laughs> drama and it's silly, but um I wonder how many how many uh House fans ended up going into some sort of medicine because you know when you don't know any better it's like oh this is just super cool this is what you do every day just solve these crazy yeah. cases that you'll know yeah. enough that do. aren't realistic that yeah. you realize that department doesn't even exist. it doesn't exist yeah. anywhere <laughs> that, would, that would be it just be like the mickey or something it's just insane. it would it would like hemorrhage money constantly oh i mean the four uh, we won't get into it now but it's just, <laughs> we're gonna have ridiculous. a whole episode dedicated to the economy <laughs> of uh the house of yeah. house Dude, so, okay, so you go to pharmacy school, uh, residency afterwards, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Where'd you go to residency at? So, again, Advent Health Orlando. It used to be called Florida Hospital, so I don't know if that name rings a bell for some people. Uh, But then from there, great program, super huge hospital, 1,900 bed, you know, just mega hospital. that's huge. And then I go to Grady, this in downtown Atlanta, and it's everything, you know, as far as from an emergency medicine standpoint, third busiest ED in the nation. Wow. Probably top one or two in acuity. So when it comes to seeing crazy stuff and being hands on the bedside, that was like a blessing for me. And I'm fortunate to still be like PR in there now. So every once in a while, I go back and pick up a shift and get to see some pretty cool stuff. It's a pretty long haul down there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Very cool. So, um, you know, after... You finished residency and all that, you know, you start working and doing your thing. How, how did you transition into doing the podcast? That was the cool thing. So me and my co-resident in PGY1, we tried to do something and we called it BB Talks. 
And it was a preceptor there who was really cool. And we would just have traditional, just calm conversations. And he really made us interested to learn critical care. And we would like go to happy hour and have this thing called BB Talks. And I was like, man, we should record this because this is like pretty chill. And we're still talking about things that's pretty cool. And I didn't have time to follow that right. up. But after I got done with residency, I was like, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Like, I want to do something that's not boring, but have like pretty cool topics and in the hospital. And, you know, we had some people that's in, in, in the, the space now. But for me, I wanted something a little bit more urban. I wanted something a little bit more. And I think as soon as you listen to my podcast, the intro, I hope it like, gets to. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, the intro's fire. <laughs> like, to, yeah. to get you guys going. So that's what got me into it. I just wanted to make something that was entertaining, but educational. That's great. And similar with us, I guess we were heavily influenced by. Um, something we had at our school called Bar and Grill, which sounds like a, a similar thing, just talking about medicine and evidence. And we thought it was fun and we we're like, we should record this. And that's kind of part of the inception, I think. In, so it, it's always blown my mind, like at these big universities or programs, or whatever, like they have so many crazy intelligent people there that have so much knowledge. And it's like, they do topic discussions, journal clubs, all this stuff. And like, no one thinks to record this and put it on the internet. Like, yeah. I, I remember or, you were saying you just wanted to go and literally take a camera and just record them talking the yeah. whole time and release it. And yeah. I, I, asked, I was like, why don't we, why don't we, no, no one, no one wants to do this. <laughs> I was just like, this is like, I mean, this, this is the, the biggest way to build the program and get eyes on it and provide free education. And I don't know. It's weird. I'm, yeah. I'm wondering how that's going to transition over. So instead of it being a bunch of smart people who we record, it's just us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so instead of people being, uh, yeah, qualified or like intelligent, we just, me and Cole talk. And they bring on smart people to talk yeah. about the the hard topics. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> Love it. But um, yeah, no, that's cool, man. I uh, I'm, I'm such a huge advocate for just finding some kind of whether it's a podcast or a you know written blog or something to do like that outside of the regular you know nine to five, if you will. Because I feel like I don't know. I, I'm sure yours has opened up plenty of opportunities oh, for man. you. Yeah, <laughs> it is one of the best things I ever did. Yeah. So it's been cool. See, so all you guys are like tired of me saying all that stuff. Told you. <laughs> Best thing you ever did. There you go. Proof of concept. <laughs> but um, so today we're doing a critical care type topic. Um, we haven't done, I think we talked about this maybe like a couple of years ago with mm-hmm. uh, with Brian Gilbert on the show, but we haven't done anything like this in a while. So I'm, I'm excited to have you on. Um, there's been a few like um, updates to the guidelines and stuff last month. And um, I guess in October, because when people hear this, it'll be December. It's November 30th. You guys listen. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, Jimmy, wh- where, where do we can we start with all this? Because, you know, we have students, we have providers, everybody in between listening. So what's a good way to place to start when you're thinking about sepsis? So I think this we can just go back and just remind ourselves, what is sepsis and what is septic shock? Because the definition has really changed over the years. And depending on what edition that you've really uh, read the last, I think it's just good to go back over what's the textbook definition and then what's like the the Jimmy version? What's like the super <laughs> simple, I'm not super smart, and I just want to understand what's going on. So if you look at what is like sepsis, what the guidelines say, it's a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Yeah, lots of words, lots of stuff that sounds, you know, intriguing. But how I think of it as your body gets an infection and freaks out. We all have that aunt that when something happens that's like normal, she just freaks the heck out. And like she does a lot more damage than the actual event that caused her to freak out. And I think that's sepsis. That's like, I call it Aunt Sepsy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like my overall view. But your body just freaks out and have this similar to an anaphylactic reaction to the infection. And then that leads to a host of other things that leads to your, your organs not being perfusions in a way that's be able to maintain perfusion throughout the rest of the body. So, you know, as, as far as the initial infection, you know, we thinking what type of, you know, gram positive, gram negative, anaerobes, all the above, fungi, what are we thinking? Yeah, so it can be a, any of those. And that's like the, that's the beauty of, of sepsis. You don't know what it is. It can be, it's just a pathogen, so to say. So we, we don't know, we have COVID, it's been such a huge thing over, over the last few years. That can be the source, or it can be just your simple strep pneumonia that can be the source, or it can be influenza. It can be any pathogen. And I like to keep it simple there because you can get to fungi, you can get into a host of other causes, but I think we have to just focus on the fact that something causes this reaction to start. 
And it's usually something that causes an infection, and it can be fungal, bacterial, viral, and a host of other things. So really just a regular infection where your body is not responding correctly. And we know there's risk factors with age and with comorbidities. Do you have a specific type of patient that you generally see present this way, or is it all across the spectrum? I think the more common patients that I see, again, I'm fortunate because I had a patient earlier today, is your classic elderly a uh, person who has comorbidities such as like hypertension, things that we traditionally see, diabetes, things of that nature that puts them at increased risk of an infection, but it also puts them at increased risk of their body freaking out. And those are the people who I traditionally see. And I, unfortunately, I think of it as it's, it's, it's you know, it's me, ma. It's me, ma's the one who's, who's having this, you know, this problem. And those are the people who have this really bad dysregulation and lead to all the things we'll talk about later on. Gotcha. So we've got Aunt Sepsi and we've got Mima. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess we can, we'll save some of the uh, pathogens that we're thinking about when we talk about the actual antibiotics. But um, so somebody comes in and we're trying to figure out, you know, as far as one, if it's sepsis, right? And then like also like how critically ill they are. So like, can you walk us through that? Because if, if I remember correctly, there's been some at least um, – re-explanations or updates to the guidelines? Yeah, so I think the, the first thing we have to look at is just figuring out what we're going to call it. I think the definition is going to lead us in different areas. So we have, again, we start off, we have this pathogen that leads to the dysregulation. And once we have that dysregulation, what is it? Is it sepsis? Is it severe sepsis? Is it septic shock? And I think that's where we start getting very intrigued. We have to figure out what that is. And recently, with the new guidelines, we've changed that definition. So people get very confused. But I think to make it very simple, what the guidelines have done, we have two things now. You just have sepsis, which encompasses severe sepsis as well from the old definition, but you just have sepsis, and then you move forward to have septic shock. And I think once you get there, it helps you with the rest of the guidelines because they don't say if it's bacteria plus sepsis. It says sepsis, suspected sepsis, or septic shock. So I think it's good to, to notice that. So we talked about what sepsis is. Up front, you have this dysregulation where you're going to have Sears criteria, which is going to be the, the, the key thing. And then or if you have septic shock. That's when things went wrong, even after you tried to provide initial resuscitation. And what the guidelines is going to say for that is going to be a subset of sepsis, which particularly profound circulatory, cellular metabolic abnormalities, which increase mortality. And what that's going to look like on paper is profound hypotension requiring vasopressors to maintain a mean arterial pressure of 65, or if you have a blood lactate that's greater than 2 millimoles per deciliter. So and that's after having body resuscitation. So those are the, pick, the big two definitions that you need to start off with. And from there, the entire guideline just goes down. So you've tried to treat them. They're not getting better. Septic shock. Yeah. Gotcha. But I remember when I was in going through rotations, um, there was a push to get away from the Q sofa, which I guess we're now far removed from that. And that's not preferred anymore as far as classification and trying to figure out where they are on that spectrum. Right. Absolutely. Or I was going to say, or is it, is it that we, it's not preferred at all or is it just not preferred as like the sole instrument? So now again, initially it wasn't preferred to be the, the sole thing. Now it's complete out of it. Out. Okay. So I think what the census guideline did, and this is like the first thing, that they looked at is I think they made a boo-boo. I think that we jumped on board with using QSOFA as a tool to identify patients when it really should just let us know how sick they are. So identifying a patient versus uh, identifying how sick they are, two different things. And when you start adding the fact that you have guidelines and you have different regulatory bodies that's going to push you to report these things, that's what things get out of whack. And subsequent data actually showed that it wasn't sensitive enough of a tool to use to identify patients with sepsis and they completely taken it out of it now. So what about like news, muse, um, those like scoring systems, are those utilized at all? I've never, never, I've never used them. I've never been taught them by anyone. And I don't know any of my providers who have used them as well. So that's something that I think is interesting. There's other research related tools, but the key thing that's always been used, uh, I think previously was the Q, Q sofa, the sofa didn't let the Q sofa need mm -hmm. Sears criteria. And that's what is now <laughs> we're, we're moving back to what that used to be. Okay. So using our Sears criteria. So I think that's where we identify some of these patients with, and then the source of infection as well. That's going to be a key thing as well. Gotcha. So patient comes in, you've kind of classified them as, you know, being septic. Are, are they automatically going to the ICU? 
at that point? So it, it depends. We actually, one thing that people think is that every single patient that's septic is going to be like the super, super sick patient. There's a tremendous amount of patients who are not in septic shock that septic and they go to the floor. So those patients, I have some of my colleagues in internal medicine, they deal with these patients every day because realistically, if you're, after you get volume resuscitation, the next thing is going to, we're going to talk about this later, but going to your antibiotics and these patients, if identified correctly and treated appropriately, they don't progress to that septic shock. So I think that makes it a lot easier when you're thinking about where these patients go. I traditionally think if they're on vasopressors, they go to the ICU. If they're not on vasopressors, they, they go to the floor. And it's a, my IC, my ED physicians will tell you, it is very hard to get a patient to go to the ICU. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> it's not like, oh, this, this patient yeah, just looks grab sick. a bed. No, it doesn't work that way. Like you have to justify it to the ICU team to get them in there? Is Absolutely. that the difficulty? It's gotcha. a ton of pushback. So everyone's saying no initially. Yeah. So you think about that time when you, you wanted your friends to come hang out with you, and you had to talk to your mom about it. Mm. You had to have a really good, <laughs> a really good you know, reason why. That's right. how it is to admit a patient to any service. So yeah. you really have to have your ducks in order to figure out where you're going to go. Because I'm sure they're full or busy and they don't want to be given a patient that is not appropriate for their area. And yep. so you have to justify it. Absolutely. Interesting. So, okay. So at this point, you know, we get them either, you know, it's somewhere in the hospital, they're inpatient at this point. What's our absolutely like first step? So I think that how we look at this, and this is kind of plays nicely into the guidelines is the, your initial resuscitation. So I think from a pharmacy standpoint, what that usually looks like is the component of using intravenous fluids. And we've actually had a, a few new like recommendations that we should we should look at. But I think the key thing to look at is give your patient a significant amount of fluids. And that definite that, that term that you want to look at is 30 mL per kilo. That's that number has stayed the same. Many people question this amount, but I think that's where the guidelines continue to recommend. And they've softened their recommendation a little bit, but that's the, the key thing we have to look at is giving them a significant amount of fluids up front to replace that intravascular depletion that we have. And, you know, and I'm, I'm going to I'll go back just a quick second because I do know one of the people on Instagram uh, that follows us had, had asked about some of the studies and whatnot dealing with um, like the goal directed therapy um, versus like, you know, just a regular standard um, resuscitation target, I guess, um, and to our standard therapy versus the specific resuscitation targets. Um, and so initially, if I remember, if, if I read correctly, that it looked like if he had more, you know, goal directed therapies, it was better outcomes. And then the follow up studies like the um, Arise and, and, process, the, and all those, yeah. so those showed they didn't really kind of echo the same results. So. Absolutely. And I think if we go back to the river studies back in the early, you know, 2000s, what they did was a lot different than what we do now so when they established and you know shout out to Manny Rivers he, he created something that was phenomenal but I think what happened is they had central lines in everyone they had certain they was given blood everyone was on dobutamine everyone was on these different therapies and we went from the wild wild west to something being organized and from there practice over the period of time from 2005 to what we have now has changed tremendously across the board the standard of care has increased and the process and the rise and all these trials have shown that if everyone's already doing a lot of these things already and they're doing it very well, so having this guideline, you know, goal directed care didn't necessarily make any difference when it came to outcomes. Um, so I think we've kind of went away from being very stringent on that. And this, these, again, three trials back to back in the same time period has said the same thing over and over again. We don't have to do the exact same thing for each patient because all patients are very unique in their etiology and what they need. Yeah, and that makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay, so when you, you said fluid resuscitation, um, fluid could be a very uh, broad term. So what, can you give us some uh, insight as far as what, what are we talking about when we say fluids? Yeah, so and the guidelines actually do a good, good job of this as well. So traditionally, we had normal saline, a 0.9% normal saline, which were usually provided us with about 154 milliequivalents of sodium and 154 milliequivalents of chloride. That is intriguing because, again, that's not physiologic to our, you know, blood plasma. And now they're recommending for us to use balanced crystalloids, which has a more uh, balanced overall composition. What, overall, what that means is we just have a lower chloride amount that's closer to what we have in our normal reference range. And there's a few studies that looked at this to eat, to eat some of the salt trials, uh, some of those that actually showed that maybe there's a benefit to mortality with using these balanced crystalloids because there's some 
you know, unwanted side effects like hyperchromic acidosis mm -hmm. that can have increase in kidney uh, dysfunction. So those things were what we what made us look at this in the mortality uh, benefit towards the balanced crystalloids. So that's what made us go that route. And a few of the studies went that way. So those are the two big agents. And we talk about lactated ringers. It's the more common balanced one that okay. most people have in their shop. You may hear plasmalite. It's another agent, which is a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. That, again, most of the studies actually looked at. But, again, it's a little bit more expensive compared to lactated ringers. Both of these agents have been around for a while. But now... I primarily in my in my ED here and and when I go back to Grady, we primarily use lactated ringers now. Okay. okay. So why would they use the plasma light at all? Just because that was what was included in the study, so they might say we're just going to be, you know, we're going to be very specific and use what was yeah. in the study. I think of like lisinopril, losartan. You know, you, you get very detailed if you mm -hmm. want to, and it's just what's available. I've been yeah. in certain shops that just don't have it. Right. So you, you you use what you have, and I think that's why I think the guidelines did a great job of saying, "Hey, I just want a balanced crystal balanced crystalloid." Crystal. Gotcha. So how did the debate initially start between crystalloids versus colloids in this situation? Oh man, if we go back to that, we, we're gonna upset some ICU people <laughs> just talking about it. But you start going back, and again, the primary agent that we use from a colloid standpoint is going to be your albumin that we can use versus using your crystalloids. And once they looked at the therapy of uh, comparing crystalloids versus colloids with albumin, they didn't see any, any difference. Um, there is a very small population who, if you receive a, a large volume of crystalloids, then you can transition over to that just to prevent volume overload. But that's a very small population. And if you have uh, either... Uh, functioning kidney or if you have dialysis you can remove that volume so that's something we can do a good job of but the overall they didn't show any benefit of using a collar compared to a crystalloid in most of the studies i would say but the price point oh man the price point is going to be crazy we're talking right. about less than a dollar for a crystalloid hmm. we're talking about any you know depending on again this has changed over the years but we're talking about hundreds of dollars for therapies of albumin. Yeah. And it just, it sounds cool. The science is great, but the outcomes are lacking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got to hate when that happens. <laughs> yeah. Got to hate when those trials poke holes in what you want to do. I know. <laughs> so, okay. So how do we like measure like the responsiveness um, to the fluid resuscitation? Oh man, that's, that's a great question. And something that I'm happy, I get to see every day. Um, I'm literally at the bedside. So there's a few ways we can do this. And the guideline is going to ask us to use more dynamic markers of volume res responsiveness. So we're not just going to look at your blood pressure, your heart rate, things of that nature. We're going to do a few things. We can do a passive leg raise where we raise the leg up and then we can monitor the cardiac output after doing that. And that's a quick test that I actually teach some of our pharmacy learners because it's a pretty cool thing to notice that if you raise their leg, you're, you're ultimately giving them a 500 ml bolus of a crystalloid. Hmm. So you just, you know, we have that, um, that volume resting in our, in our legs. If we raise it up, our body's going to receive that, increase our stroke volume. And potentially, if they're volume responsive, then we should see an increase in cardiac output which should, in theory, manifest as an increase in blood pressure. If you have invasive devices, you can see your map and things of that nature. Uh, that's one thing you can do. You can do in fluid challenges as well. Again, just give them fluids and see how to respond to that. There's a host of other more, um, I would say, interesting tools that I don't have at the bedside, um, like stroke volume variation, things of that nature, that my ICU colleagues can get with additional advanced monitoring. But And those are really you know, are very good at being able to determine your, you know, your volume um, responsiveness. That's cool. All right. So we do the fluid resuscitation. Um, at that point, are we going after the infection? Absolutely. So really, honestly, this is what, how the guidelines make it look. Uh, but really this is happening at the same time at the bedside. Okay. So you give your, you, like today I gave my fluids and immediately after that, I got my antibiotics while the nurse is drawing cultures. So again, that's the next step and getting this done. But I think you have to find your source of infection or just presume. So a lot of what the guidelines going to talk about is your suspected, possible or suspected or pr probable. So being able to identify where you're at in that ballpark, I think of it as if you're pretty sure or you're certain we're going to do this. If you're like, I don't really know, then the guidelines give you an out to say, you don't have to do antibiotics immediately. So you can, traditionally, if you thought any of those antibiotics within one hour, mm -hmm. we went that route. Now, if you're pretty sure or, or you're, you're pretty certain, go ahead and give antibiotics within that hour. But if you're not, 
you continue your work up, you have a little bit more time. So that's the next step in identifying what to do, find your source. And that can be very tricky because you have to look for all these things. And if you have to get a check x-ray, you have to get a urine analysis that doesn't come back in time. So you really have to just identify where do you think the source of infection is. And from there, the guidelines does a phenomenal job of getting more in depth. So it's not even just so much thinking empirically based on common pathogens, but also the location of where those pathogens could be. Absolutely. And does it matter if they've been classified as being in shock or not in shock as far as that timing thing goes? Absolutely. So if, again, if sepsis is definite or probable, if shock is present, you have to go ahead and give antibiotics within one hour. If you don't have shock, that's where it gets interesting, where if it's possible, you can you can give it within that time frame if they're still in, if they're still in shock. But if there is shock is absent and you're, if it's just possible, they give you an outing to do a rapid assessment of infectious versus non-infectious causes and administer antimicrobials within three hours if concerns of infection still persist. So it really helps out. And I think that's why I want to start earlier, sh you know, septic shock versus right. not having shock. Right. That's why it matters to classify. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as empiric therapies then, what are some, you know, big causative pathogens that we're worried about and some takeaways for, you know, from an antibiotic standpoint? So I think, again, your, your source is going to matter. So if you, have a, if you have a urinary tract infection, which is common, pneumonia is going to be our number one location that we traditionally see followed by um, you, 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 urinary tract infection, and then you, depending on other risk factors like skin and soft tissue infection, things of that nature, based on that, then you break it down to what's your more common organism. But traditionally, we're going to think about our gram-negative or organisms like, you know, Klebsiella, E. coli, uh, Proteus, things of that nature. Those are going to be the ones that really cause a, a nasty response in the body to freak out. So those are going to be your common agent for pneumonia, for urinary tract infection. But based on your other risk factors, then you start looking at the fact that do I have MRSA? Mm. Do I have pseudomonas? Do right. I have fungal infection? So it really just determines on not only the infection in the, the site, but also patient-specific risk factors as well. So, you know, if they've, if, if there is a risk, whether, you know, if they've had prior or recent antibiotic exposure um, or any other risks of multi-drug resistant, especially with the gram negative, like Pseudomonas or a Cinebacter or something like that, um, I mean, are, what are we thinking drug-wise or are we still, we still need to rule out um, MRSA as a possibility as well or mm -hmm. double coverage, you know, recovering for one and the other as well? Yeah. So I think how I do it, I do it one at a time. So I think about MRSA because I think about the agents that I'm going to use. My ED physicians, I love them to death. <laughs> if anyone hasn't heard of them just doing vancosin or vancosin for everything that smells like an infection, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the thing. But now, and I think my, my ID cogs are happy, look at MRSA. And then say, okay, do they have a previous history of colonization with MRSA? Do they have a recent history of antibiotics? Do they have a history of recurrent skin infections or chronic wounds? Do they have any invasive devices or dialysis? Um, do they have recent hospitalizations or severe illness like having shock? And those are things that make me say, hey, I need to add on coverage for MRSA now mm -hmm. instead of just empirically. Usually, you know, prior guidelines say empirically cover very broad. Now they say if you have high suspicion of MRSA, then you cover. So now we, I think we have a better understanding of what to do. What about anaerobes? So anaerobes is going to be another agent where you have to figure out, do they have risk factors? Or, you know, I, I hate to even say this, but they have like aspiration pneumonia compared to, compared to just traditional pneumonia or multifocal pneumonia. It really just depends on the, the site of infection and the risk factors they traditionally have. If you have a patient that has a diabetic foot infection that's causing sepsis, those patients traditionally need anaerobic coverage because of the organisms that are being pleasant. And you think of intra-abdominal infections, well, those patients need anaerobic coverage just due to the site of the location. So the guideline doesn't go in, in, in depth about that, but I think that you have to figure out what your infection is and what's the traditional organisms that cause that, and then from there, base your empiric coverage on it. So thinking through all these things frequently within an hour, um, so having that tight time frame to try to make the decision, I'm sure is why people think of... Uh, critical care and ED as being you know, high stress and, and kind of intense. So I, do you enjoy that? And I imagine that oh, you man. would if you had to do it, right? Oh, man. It's, it's one of the coolest things ever. It's like I, I sit back every day and I think, hey, someone is on the border of not being here. And we have the responsibility to identify not only just prep the medications, but in, in certain cases, you identify it, what the infection is, talk to your team, 
figure out what's the common organisms, make the medication, give the medication, document the medication, and watch the patient go to the unit. Yeah. That is one of the most incredible things, especially when a patient who we thought was not going to make it comes back and gives the whole team donuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is amazing feeling. My, my blood gets flowing just talking about it. Mm -hmm. It is a phenomenal feeling to be able to take care of a sick patient and get them to the unit and make sure their family can see them and make sure that we provide them the best care possible starting off in the ED. So it is a, it is a wonderful feeling. You get very used to the scary component of it. Mm -hmm. And you just think about the, the passion to help people still. We're, we're all doing the same thing. We're all helping people. And it's just the environment may just be different. Yeah, that's pretty, I mean, it's pretty tangible too because they're very clearly sick. Mm -hmm. And then you can see a significant uh, improvement over a short period of time. Whereas outpatient, there's a lot of insidious disease states that aren't necessarily as apparent. And so maybe the the reward is a little long-winded versus uh, the quick turnaround. Like yeah, that. instant gratification, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, what, what our generation is made off of. That's very cool. That's, that's a good point. <laughs> so, okay, so that's bacteria, fungi. What are we, how are we thinking about that empirically? So I think you have to do, like, again, figuring out your Canada score or any other scoring mechanism that you want to do to determine if these patients are at high risk of that. And I, again, initially I think of patients that are immunocompromised, like our HIV population, they're on, you know, chronic immunotherapies, or if they have a history of having intra-abdominal uh, surgeries, things of that nature, those are my patients that are more commonly you know, associated with having fungal infections, but usually I work with my ID team because really, to be honest, if I'm if I want to talk about how often this is done empirically, it's not. Okay. This is something I'm probably I probably started mycofungin or some of these agents probably I probably done it a handful of times really? in, in the thousands of septic patients I've taken care of. Hmm. So again, I think it's something that again the guidelines you know show that if you have risk factors for. And based off their history and recent cultures, you can go that route. But I would say it's a handful of times. And maybe my, my practice is just really off. But when I talk to my colleagues <laughs> elsewhere, mm -hmm. some of the some of the order sets that we're making, because I've made our order set at my shop, you have to add on the fungal agents from a different place because it's just not common. Mm -hmm. So that's something we have to look at the risk factors for. But again, a lot of the time, again, in practice, this is not something that's done traditionally because, again, most of the time we we don't know enough information from, from the ED standpoint. And if we do, it's just based off cultures or based on the fact that they have a um, past medical history at least and to be at a higher risk. And then if we are treating empirically for fungal, is it typically going to be mycofungin or? Yeah, I think that's going to be, that's going to be our, our top agent. And that's what I see used more, more commonly. And we do, for us, we're lucky. We just give one dose and then the team that's upstairs kind of continue that or they can discontinue it. Right. Nice. Right. Is there ever a time, um, like they were, you're using fluconazole or voriconazole? I would say in the ED, not necessarily, but this is kind of an overall podcast. Again, mm -hmm. once you get them upstairs and you have cultures, then you can go that route. So I think initially we just cover very broadly. I think of microfungus as my vanxosin, mm -hmm. antifungus. Right. And then we can get very specific about which agent we want to use. And some of my critical care colleagues can probably speak a little more to that than, than I can. But traditionally I see it start off with that and then we can de-escalate and get more detail based off more information that we have. Gotcha. And, and one of the reasons for that is because of the resistance or we're starting to see all the different Canada species, oh, right? Oh man, it's getting bad. I think ac across the board, I think we want to, if we look at certain agents that we use commonly, you know, fluconazole is given out like candy. Mm -hmm. it, fluconazole is the moxicillin of antifungals. <laughs> so it's something we have to be conscious of and cover broadly and then, then go for it to de-escalate into susceptible agents. Right. And is it uh, Glabrata or Crusa that's like 100% resistant to fluconazole, I, I, one of those? I thought it was Glabrata. Okay, right. I think that's right. Yeah. I feel like I wrote it down at some point, and I don't know where I put it, so that's a guess. Put but it in your brain. That's where somewhere. it is. Somewhere. <laughs> Barely. But, um, so, okay, so more so empiric antibiotics unless we have a better reason for a fungal, um, and then if we need to go that route, then we can. But, um duration how long we treat these patients for so the cool thing the guidelines did this time they actually recommended for us to use shorter duration of therapies now um i think most of my colleagues that taking care of patients in the in the unit or in the floor we're used to seeing patients with pneumonia getting treated for 10 days a little longer the guidelines and the data does not pan out to that five to seven days is what we traditionally would see and then the guidelines also tells us if the duration is uncertain based off clinical factors and procalcitonin levels, then we can de-escalate our care based off that. So it really helps out quite a bit, but everything they say use the shorter end of, of treatment. 
Yeah, I'm sure the the medical team is used to the pharmacist bugging them to <laughs> de-escalate or come off the antibiotics and every day. Always. Yeah. Is, and, um, intra-abdominals even shorter. Is that right? Like four yeah. days or something? Yeah, three to, three to five days. And usually you have some type of source control. Um, I'm fortunate that most of my intra-abdominal sepsis patients are traumas. And there's a reason why you have that, mm-hmm. whether it's some type of penetration with a, a accident or a GSW or something that causes that. And they go in for washouts. They go in for surgeries that have source control. Because that's going to be a big thing that we don't think about as pharmacists. We can give as many antibiotics as we want to. If we don't have source control, right. we're not going to ever do anything. So I think right. it's three to five days, again, once you get past that source control component. Gotcha. Um, so what about if it's from like a skin soft tissue, debridement and all that stuff is just right along with it, just like you would with... Any other? Absolutely. You just want you, you know, if you have a component that can be surgically, have surgical intervention, you go that route. I think the patients that are a little, a little bit more sicker is going to be your uh, necrotizing fasciitis patients where you have to go in and do for a surgical procedure or your diabetic foot infection. Well, maybe you need an amputation. I had an amputation that kind of needed to happen yesterday. Oh, wow. And I was like, I can sit here and give Frank Zosin until my eyes fall out my head. But if you don't go and ch- cut that toe off, <laughs> it's right. going to be there forever. It had maggots and everything in it. Ooh, oh, my gosh. It was gnarly. Gosh. Jeez. Diabetes? Or- oh, yeah. Jeez. Ouch. You do not want maggots in your foot. I'll tell you that right now. I've never had it, but Speaking it sounds... Speaking from experience. <laughs> no, it just sounds horrific. Um, okay, so antibiotics, and then what about uh, hemodynamic But before management. I get there, I just want to mention one yeah. thing that yeah, the yeah. guidelines added when it comes to a... And I think especially for pharmacists. So they recommend pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic uh, assessments of these patients and make sure you optimize that, a.k.a. pharmacist pharmacy to dose. That's exactly what that means. If you have patients that need levels, this is basically saying make sure someone's monitoring this. And for most hospital systems, that's a pharmacist. So definitely want to put a, a plug in for that. And another component of what they did was also recommend for using can, uh, extended infusions of beta-lactam, things of that nature, where versus using the short 30-minute zone, mm-hmm. the short you know period of time. So after the initial bolus, because my patients in the ED, I'm giving them initial IV push of those things. And then from there they can go and get the extended infusion that they need. Gotcha. Yeah, no, that's the just best. to increase the time over the MSA. Yeah, absolutely. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to vary based because they didn't say just beta-lactam. They went through almost all of the agents and recommended you to optimize their pharmacokinetics. So again, they m- m- mentioned it for adaptomycin. They mentioned it for, you know, your fluoroquinolones for all of those. So I think it, it basically means your pharmacy to optimize the dosing patterns to make sure your patient get the most effective therapy because I was listening to one of my ID colleagues earlier. We think that if we give a certain dose, that we're going to achieve optimal levels. When you get to a lot of the very in-depth ID data, that's not necessarily the case. Mm-hmm. We may be underdosing a significant amount of our patients based on patient-specific factors. So I think this is a big plug that more of my you know uh, infectious disease and critical care colleagues can get deeper into. But I think that's a major plug for us and something that we can heavily impact. So that's my big thing about uh, the antimicrobials, things overall, just the fact that you don't have to empirically give MRSA coverage. You have to have risk factors. You don't have to empirically give double coverage of multi-drug resistant organisms if you don't have increased risk. You don't have to start uh, antivirals. You don't have to do these things empirically. You have to have risk factors. So when making your guidelines, and I'm fortunate to just get down making ours, I've now placed it and other people are placing it to where you have to identify why you want additional coverage because what we don't think about is the fact that additional agents actually been led to having unnecessary additional agents is associated with increased mortality in certain patient populations. So if you have a patient that doesn't have MRSA, that's getting vank compared to a patient who, who, who does, again, those patients who don't necessarily need it actually do worse overall. Mm-hmm. So that's something we have to pay attention to, not just the C. diff rates, not just in resistance. They actually do worse off overall. Well, I guess it, it's just more for your body to have to deal with when it's already getting... A hurricane, Crush. Of, yeah, crush. I mean, that I mean, makes sense. That's cool because yeah. yeah. the old the 2016 guidelines were just basically a blanket empiric, yeah. just give as broad as possible, right? Yeah, this, yeah. that's so the they went thing. a lot deeper this time. This is again, this is a mate, this my, my favorite section of the guidelines, uh, the, the infection component because it really helped out uh, pharmacists and help people understand what they need to do and not be penalized for that. Now, if you have certain risk factors, if you have shock, we now have you know, very detailed guidance on what to do. That's cool. So what's the next step? Absolutely. So we, we get back into our hemodynamic management and that's where I play a really big role in, in, in my current role. And it's really cool to see. And we talked about fluids 
when we talked about making sure we assess the, the response to fluids and we're making sure we're given that amount and that type of fluid. But after that, what do you do? You know, you start vasopressors. Hope for the best. And <laughs> you just like, you pray, and you, yeah, hope, yeah. You, you, you hope that things don't get bad. But I think you start with vasopressors. And the cool thing now, we have a little bit more guidance here. A uh, prior guideline just said, okay, norepinephrine is preferred. Then after that, well, you can do epi or you can do vasopressin. Now we have a pretty, you know, detailed order and rate to when initiate this. So just to start off with, we're going to have our norepinephrine infusion as our first line agent. Most of people refer to it as levofet. And you're going to be able to, just to get that started. And you're going to have some alpha activity. You're going to have some beta-1 activity. Not as potent as epinephrine and other agents, but you have pretty strong and potent alpha activity. And that's going to raise your blood pressure quite a bit. And the goal of this, of course, is to get our mean arterial pressure to 65. And not only did they mention that the MAP needs to be 65, they actually recommend the MAP is 65 over higher therapies. Because traditionally, we, we didn't have, we just said, just get 65. Now it's, we've looked at other data that doesn't support using higher MAPs. So start your norepinephrine infusion, get your MAP to above 65, and then go from there. Gotcha. So, okay, so norepinephrine is first line um, vasopressor. And then what, because uh, it's for, you mentioned um, like epi and um, vasopressin and stuff like that. Like, did you, is there like a, like, is it protocol driven as far as like hospital is it hospital or is it like a set everyone does the exact same way as far as when to augment versus. So tr traditionally it was that it's just, everyone does it their own way. Now the guidelines like you recommend, if you get to your norepinephrine infusion and the rate is at 0 0.25 micrograms per kilogram per minute, or for people who don't use that terminology, it's around 17 to 35 micrograms per minute. Once you get there, the guidelines now give you recommendations to initiate vasopressin. And not only does it tells you that, it also gives you a fixed dose of 0 0.03 units per minute. And that's going to be for your, your treatment. And that's going to be a fixed dosing. There are some studies that go up to 0 0.06 units per minute, but that's not common. But that's the next step. And they did that because they said, based off the mechanism of action, if you start epinephrine, you're going to be hitting the same receptors for the most part and a little bit more beta, and we don't see a major benefit in that. And the studies haven't shown to be a benefit in starting epinephrine compared to starting vasopressin. And the great thing about vasopressin is that it works in a, a non-catecholamine way where you can have those V1 receptors tightening to be able to increase your, uh, your blood pressure. You can also have your V2 receptors that ultimately helps you hold on to water. That water and, and, and salt goes back up and increases your stroke volume. All of these things augment to make you have a higher blood pressure. That's good. That's good because my next question was going to be why vasopressin over epi. So you <laughs> beat me to it. That's great. Um, okay, so is, is that pretty, I mean, standard then as far as the vasopressors or anything else like after vasopressin that you have to, like you can add on a third agent? Absolutely. So this is where epinephrine now got demoted to. They got put in a dungeon. <laughs> Number three. Uh, and it's, it's intriguing because again, tr depending on which state of shock you're in, your your body's, your heart is kicking up pretty good. You're going to be tachycardic quite, quite a bit and it's trying to perform the best it can. So at this point, it gives a recommendation for your traditional patient that you can start epinephrine here. Uh, and then that's the major components they give for vasoactive agents. The cool thing is this. If you look in the guidelines from past and look now, one agent you see that's missing is phenylephrine. Hmm. It's no longer in this update of the guidelines. Hmm. And we've seen previously that the data doesn't actually support the use of it in these patients. And traditionally, it's used as salvage therapy. But even then, you're so clamped down with your alpha-1 with norepinephrine there's no additional benefit, so to say. Right. And so they don't recommend it anymore. I've been to certain shops where, for some reason, this was the first line therapy for them. And I'm happy. To, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, uh, and now we have data saying, hey, maybe that's that's not a bad That's not a good idea. That's a really bad idea. Mm -hmm. So much so we won't even include it into the guideline. Yeah. That's funny. Wow. Um, what are, so what happened with dopamine? So dopamine really got booted, man. The sub-2 trial that compared it versus norepinephrine really showed that there's no major difference in outcomes in the overall population. But in those patients that were septic, you actually seen an increase in arrhythmia rates by double. So I think it was 12% mm. in the norepinephrine rate versus 24% yeah, in the dopamine rate. And those patients just didn't do as well overall. 
So there was no major benefit and the guidelines. Actually, they stipulate that they like norepinephrine over dopamine with a, a high quality evidence. So now, unlike other agents, we really have this point to where what is it going to provide for you? And if you start thinking about, you know, getting back to your chemistry days, dopamine is going to turn into norepinephrine. Mm-hmm. So let's go ahead and skip to the chasing right. the real stuff. Yeah, that makes total sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's cool. Um, what about uh, angiotensin two? That's going to be that's my sleeper. So the guidelines have low evidence to support its use now, but I think if you if you look at the mechanism and you look at the fact that it's, it's not going through the calicolamine pathway, it may be an agent for us in the future, but right now the guidelines didn't have enough data to recommend it over some of the other agents because, again, we have only have a few trials that are out right now that looks at its, its care, and it just didn't outperform anything as much. So I think it, the next edition... I'm going to go ahead and say it here. We're going to see an upgrade in the use of angiotensin 2, and we're going to have an increase in the, the recommendation for it, just simply due to the fact it's going to be your, I believe it's going to be up there with vasopressin, and we can be able to use it in, in that fashion. But right now, we don't have enough data to support its use compared to other other agents that we have on board. So I think that's the the main thing. And I think when we revisit this, we just go ahead and book our calendars for, you know, four or five years from now. We do episode again. It'll be upgraded. You heard it here first. Yeah. I'm, dude, I'm telling you, I've said it once. I've said it a hundred times. Me and Jimmy are just ahead of our time when it comes to this type of stuff. We're, we're predicting all kinds of crazy stuff on the podcast. So, all right. So, Vasopressors, what's the next kind of step or um, thing we got to consider and think about while we're treating the patient. So the guidelines jump around and I I don't want to get too far ahead of myself when it comes to this, but you also have a few things in your back pocket. You have steroids now. And if you go to the other therapies and you scroll all the way down to that, 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 that section to additional therapies, they actually increase their recommendation. So prior, if you failed fluid resuscitation and you failed vasopressor therapies, then you can consider using it. Now they give a stronger recommendation to to actually give it. So it says for adult with septic shock and ongoing requirement for vasopressor therapy, we suggest using the IV corticosteroids. So that's a that's a big jump compared to if they felt this and felt that. If you're just on vasopressors, you can go that route. You don't even, you don't even have to go to vasopressin. You can just start on norepinephrine, and then depending on what's going on, you can add on 200 milligrams of hydrocortisone. Right. And what is it about hydrocortisone specifically? Especially in obviously the ICU type situations, you always see that one pop up. Why, why that as opposed to some of the other corticosteroids? I think one of the big things is that it's going to have a lot of the mineral, mineral corticocorts components to it to where it's going to be able to help from a fluid standpoint. And it's the most studied. Now, I will say this isn't something that always happened. I commonly see dexamethasone use. I commonly see methylprednisolone use as well. So I would say the guidelines recommend this, and this is something that we have the most data on. I, I do see a variation from this quite a bit, actually, uh, when it comes to treating patients with septis, because you start looking, well, their pneumonia and their COPD, and I want to get them the anti-inflammatory properties. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the thing that people don't realize as well is that using your corticosteroids actually upregulate some of your beta receptors as well. So that helps some of your epinephrine and some of your mm. other, your norepinephrine work a little bit more efficiently. Mm-hmm. So that helps out as well. And it also going to cause you to have just independently of that, again, theorized to have an increase in your systemic vascular resistance as well. Right. So you have a multi-tier component with anti-inflammatory upregulation of some receptors and then potentially, again, have some increase in your blood pressure as well. So is everyone going to get those or is that if they're not responding to to the initial vasopressor. So yeah, so if they don't respond gotcha. to the initial yeah. vasopressor. But again, I commonly see this given today. Commonly see it <laughs> given around the same time. We started, hey, it's not working. I'm like, we just started five minutes ago. Oh, so, the guidelines say you can, it's, it, it's, I consider it not to be working, so. Right. Okay, so that's what I was going to ask. Like, how don't long of any, a time frame yeah. do we wait? Again, they, they look at this, again, some of the studies looking at using norepinephrine or epinephrine at 0.2 micrograms per kilo per minute at least four hours after initiation. Uh, however, again, what I usually see is this done a lot sooner than that, to be honest. Um, and the data is a little all over the place. But is it a better safe than sorry approach or? Is... That's the ED altogether. Yeah. 
Yeah. You may just do do it and suffer the consequences later. They can the ICU, the floor, they can all stop. They'll take care of it. Yeah. <laughs> OPP, man. Other people's problem. Right. That's funny. So what about your glucose control? When you if you do have to start IV steroids like that, I mean, does that make it that much harder to control the oh, glucose? Oh man, it is a nightmare. Yeah. It is a nightmare. And I've commonly had patients on our traditional so the guidelines gonna say they recommend keeping your blood sugar less than one one eighty. And then once you initiate therapy, they want to keep you around that 144 to 180 range. So don't drop too low. Uh, it's an entire different episode about glucose control in ICU. But I think some of the things we can do is focus on just making sure that we get our blood, our blood sugar down. And you can do that with an insulin drip if you want to, but that becomes messy. I've commonly seen patients initiate it, patients, you know, it gets forgotten to get their repeat blood sugar in an hour and their blood sugar is 20. Oh, and, and, now, and now they're intubated. Jeez. And they have an, an add additional problem onto the sepsis. Yep. So that's one thing to look at as well. So it's a, it's, a, it's not easy. And you start to have to add on scheduled ins, sub-Q insulin to match the profile. So commonly you'll see MPH or you can see regular insulin used as well to help mirror that profile of the, the increase in blood sugar when you're using the hydrocortical hydrocortisone so it just really depends but in answer your question it makes it challenging and i yeah. hated this on my ICU rotations i can't even, it drives me crazy when someone gets like you know it for the osteoarthritis or, something, or yeah. something like that like an injection just dealing with their diabetes i can't even imagine dealing with it in the icu yeah. I'm like who gave them steroids <laughs> <laughs> like do they need this like yeah. no uh, well, I feel like that's in, like you were saying earlier, some of the providers jumping the gun, um, but that's like could set you up for failure with that on the back end. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a seems like a very tight balancing act. And that's where, again, something that came up today that we, we don't talk about because it's not in the guideline, but you have to have a great pass off with your, your pharmacist in other areas. Um, when I have a very sick patient that I transfer to the unit, mm -hmm. I try to find a pharmacist on the floor and say, hey, this is what we did. Um, I don't necessarily know if we need this, please review this because the blood sugar may get elevated or the blood pressure is low because the IV line was kinked and right. the patient wasn't getting any fluid. So I think having an adequate pass off, not only from ED to ICU, but even from ICU to the floor. And if you have a relationship as a system from the floor to the outpatient pharmacist as well. So mm -hmm. to manage all of that, because a lot of this can be managed. It's not just a one time thing. Blood sugar can be elevated for a period of time. Right. All right. So, what? Uh, so, blood sugar. What, what a VTE prophylaxis, ulcer prophylaxis. Yeah. How big of a concern is that, especially yeah. early on? Man, it, it is a a big deal that I think is one of the silent killers of the ICU. Mm. These patients who are sitting, who are immobile, and they have just severe risk factors for having clots. So, you have to think about your VTE prophylaxis, and they recommend for us to use uh, chemical or pharmacologic prophylaxis and then they don't recommend for us to use a combination of the you know mechanical and the pharmacologic and the preferred aid is going to be a low molecular weight heparin mm -hmm. for us in the u.s that's going to be enoxaparin right and traditionally depending on your patient this can get tricky because your average patient that's not obese you can just give them the traditional uh 40 milligrams daily however there's a lot of data now sam for your patients that are, are obese you need to make sure you modify your therapy and some people use um, 40 milligrams twice a day or they can use 0 0.5 mix per kick BID. So it can really change. And I think this is another area where pharmacy can do a phenomenal job of optimizing therapy. What, what about in the case, especially if they have an AKI going on, are we switching to an unfractionated heparin or adultaparin or anything? So that's the, the cool thing because, again, there is renal dosing for enoxaparin. You can use 30 milligrams daily. And if they're not going for a procedure, and I think of my medical patients, they're more likely to stay in the unit and not go for procedures to require reversal. My my trauma patients, I'm a little bit more likely to mm. recommend them to get something like heparin solely due to the fact that they're gonna go more 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 commonly to the OR. But again, you can use either agent. I think traditionally what we're taught is if they have renal dysfunction overall, use heparin. Mm -hmm. Use just your unfractionated heparin. But I, I don't necessarily know That's the more data. textbook. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if the data pans out with that. And the phenomenal part about all of this. We can get levels. We can get anti 10 a levels. So, and we can get APTT right. in the levels. So, mm -hmm. we have our monitoring parameter that we can assess for this. So, I, I I would recommend for us to again, the guidelines say use your low molecular weight heparin, renal adjust if you have to. But again, there's no data saying that using heparin is going to be, you know, provide better outcomes or 
provide a safer profile than using just the the dose adjusted anoxaparin. Right. What about DOAX? Any data coming out in that front? So again, it's something that we usually do more in, in your space as mm-hmm. far as once they get off of it. It's not something that the guidelines recommend. It's not something that I see commonly at all right now. Intriguing part is if these patients has a history of HIT, mm-hmm. if, you know, yep. mm-hmm. hepatitis Yeah. then you get to where you can add different agents or again, what's more something that's coming out now, potentially you can use your, your DOAX. But again, that's a little bit more, uh, you know, shittier. Yeah. I a, just figured you had your ear to the street type of thing. I was seeing, <laughs> I was trying to get the inside scoop because <laughs> there's a, what's, what's the DOAX starts with a B. I can't remember. It's, it's inpatient. The, it's the, uh, you know what I'm talking about? I cannot think of it. Oh, uh, by, by, by Valerudin. No, 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 no. The, no that's a, that's a, that's a, yeah, it's the actual. Um, I, I can't think of it now. It's one of the DOEX, but it's only used for. I thought I want to say it was uh, used for like procedural inpatient use only. But I just was curious to see um, if you'd seen anything. Yeah, my ICU colleagues can probably can speak more. To I got that you. Now. Cool. What about uh, stress ulcer? Um, like Beck Trixaban. Beck Fixa. Yeah. Yes. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Cole. Thanks, Google. Google. S- sounds super expensive, not on formulary issues. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I would venture to say probably <laughs> That's exactly not. What it sounds like. you, you may have some of these rich hospitals that, you know, right. uh, flex their muscles out there. Uh-huh. Uh, but to answer your question, yeah, stress ulcer prophylaxis is another agent that we're, it's becoming very intriguing whether it's a thing. Mm. Um, the data doesn't necessarily pan out, and we've been waiting forever, like for the update to the guideline for that. But traditionally, your patients that are have coagulopathy, they're intubated. Most are my very sick patients. Absolutely. Give them either your H2s or PPIs and go from there. But again, make sure you're using that. And most of my ICU team is going to have an order set that automatically place these patients on it, whether they need it or not. Mm. I'm commonly checking like, hey, do we need it? Hey, patient doesn't need this because another they, thing for the pharmacist to bug the team about. Yeah, <laughs> but it's like, hey, there's a new, new another recommendation we have on round. So yeah. you know, I get to do something. Yeah. No, another another intervention. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I just get so excited about making a recommend, recommendation. I'm like, I, I recommend- told you, mom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do it. I count that's- my recommendations out, and like yeah. I've made I've made seventy six recommendations this month. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So um, PPI versus H two blogger. Is there data? Point in one direction or the other. So again, to my knowledge, again, some data's came out recently that I haven't been up to date on because it's not my practice site. But PPI has been able to show a little bit more of a benefit in preventing bleeding. But again, it goes back and forth. So mm. for every one study that shows that it provides a benefit, there's three that comes out that says there's no difference. So I think again, that's what I recently looked. But I believe that PPIs are still in certain patient populations going to be the preferred thing, and based off if they have other risk factors for C diff or any of the other reasons that. PPI is a little bit more, uh, the, the adverse effect profile doesn't match up. We can switch over to a H2, like um, Pepsid or things, something of that nature. On my internal med rotation inpatient, I remember that was like the go-to recommendations. Do they need this PPI? Why do they, why aren't they on, um, uh, what was it? Oh, it was probiotics. I remember we were doing probiotics yeah. for like, uh, for, for diarrhea and stuff. Those like the, the go-to things like just little, or like, do they need to be on this antibiotic? Can they be on an oral antibiotic? That was like the, the yeah. three things we'd always say. Yeah. IV to PO, man. IV to PO. That's, that's, yeah. that's, 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 that's bread and butter in yeah. hunter medicine, man. Yeah. That's cool. So what else? What, where else do we need to go with this patient? Is that, yeah. I think that's the big thing, but what I, one of the cool things that happened within sepsis like three or four years ago is this vitamin C. Mm. Like every time we have an infection, someone comes out with vitamin C Gotta and that's it. the cure. That's when COVID happened. Mm-hmm. Vitamin C, right. zinc. Take, yeah, just take a lot of zinc, it. You zinc, know, you, comp- you, you mix it together with your ivermectin paste from the horse and you have this. How but, dare you, sir? <laughs> but um, Paul Merrick, again, shout out to Paul Merrick. He's a phenomenal physician out in Virginia, but he initially published this remarkable paper that said that his combination cocktail, including vitamin C and steroids actually, and thiamine led to this drastic reduction in mortality. And he actually said this on like TV. He was like, if you give, if you give patients vitamin C, they don't die. I was like, (laughs) wow, (laughs) the audacity. It's true. (laughs) So he produced that. And then immediately after everyone studied it. So there's been like five or six trials now that came out and said, it actually doesn't do anything. Mm. So the guidelines actually actually went out and recommended against using IV vitamin C. So they went for, out of their way to shoot this guy down. Yeah, <laughs> like, dude, like pump your brakes. Because yeah. everyone was using it. When I was in residency, again, everyone would use it for a variety of indications. So now it's a lot more expensive than I, I initially thought it was. Uh, so it's not only more expensive, it actually causes 
it makes it difficult to read your um, glucometer uh, blood sugar. Mm. So depending on that, you can have these weird abnormalities where you, you get a, a blood a blood sugar from the actual lab itself, or you get uh, just a glucometer, and it would actually mess up with the assay. Mm. So like that was intriguing because you can have a blood sugar forty, and you can see one twenty. It's like what's going on here? Yeah, and the patient's like st- snowed because they're out. With, you know. With no blood going through your body, and <laughs> it's not ideal. So that was something, but again, overall, it's just not effective. There's mm-hmm. been tons of studies now that support that vitamin C. It was a cool concept, and the mechanisms seem very intriguing. But when it looks at multiple randomized controlled trials, like I was like five or six of them now has come out over the last few years, and it's just a slam dunk. No, like it doesn't hurt. It's expensive, but it's just completely just does not decrease mortality. So they like we we recommend. Uh, against it. It was a weak recommendation with low quality of evidence, but I think it was pretty cool. It's like, actually, yeah. let me go ahead and just put this out here. Please don't do this. Well, and I think, I think sometimes people see that as like a automatically assuming if they say recommend against it, they're because of the harm, but it's more, I mean, they're guidelines. They have to go with the data. If there's no data supporting yeah. it, they have to say they recommend against it. Absolutely. So I think that's and they something. wouldn't, you know, it's not like they have to say like, don't use uh, simvastatin in, in <laughs> sepsis because nobody's doing it, but because people were doing yeah. it with the vitamin C, they had to come out and say, yeah. no, it's actually isn't doing it. And people were saying like, my patients don't die. Like that's, that's almost like crazy to say that the leading cause of infectious disease related death in ICU. Like, <laughs> it changes all with vitamin C. So it was, Who knew? Yeah. But that, yeah, that's, that's really it. The guidelines did a really good job. Um, I will say this. Overall, this is a very well-written. Um, I've read this thing twice now, front to back, and it has a phenomenal amount of data in there. And it summarized it very well. And I think that if you're a student or you're a resident and you have a top discussion, I mean, this is a very all-inclusive guideline that you can review and you can digest and hopefully you don't get pimped, you know, because yeah. it has everything there. But I think we also can't forget that we, we're practicing medicine, we're practicing pharmacy, we're practicing these areas. So there may be some situations where we may have to deviate slightly. And I remember that these recommendations, most of them are weak recommendations. Mm-hmm based off of low quality of evidence. So I think we re- remember that and don't get so religious about these these guidelines. We can do what's best for our patient while providing an overall standard of care that's similar to what the, the study showed. And I don't think we said the name of these, but it's the Surviving Sepsis Guidelines from October 2021, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you want more info and read it back to back twice like Jimmy, <laughs> Google it. It's out there. And for you, if you guys want to be, you know, winners, just do it three times then. Show Jimmy what's up. <laughs> One up me. So I, I think that's important too. Like, you know, I'm glad we kind of you know, bring this up at the end because, you know, I think that's a big difference you see between like that transition between like, you know, having a good idea of the basics and then like transitioning to like a really good pharmacotherapist or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, the guidelines, but that's what they are. They're mm-hmm. guidelines. Those guidelines are based on the clinical studies. And then when you dive deeper into that, it's like, okay, well, would my patient even fit into those studies? Absolutely. Cause that could completely change how you're dictating with the guideline. I think that's some, that's that, the, that next level, I think thinking that's important, especially for your fourth years listening. Yeah. It's next level thinking. It's also next level effort to look into. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. that's true. And I, I have this, this, this term and I think it's got me in trouble recently, but nice. it, I think it really Tell works me. that well. Can't wait to use it. It's, it's, the, it's the LexiCount pharmacist. And I just despise this. And what a LexiCount pharmacist is, is someone who looks at LexiCount or looks at a guideline, look at something and don't think. And they page the team and say, you can't do that. <laughs> with, with no recommendations, with no other thoughts of what's going on with the patient. And we just, sometimes we teach this, you know, from an academic standpoint at times. So I'm fortunate now to work in that space as well. But I think overall, sometimes we teach them to answer things as a test question. And we practice... We, we practice in a great... We, we teach black and white in a gray world. Mm-hmm. That's and, so true. <laughs> and we, we have to tell students, residents, even clinicians who are early in their career... You can't practice solely off the guidelines without understanding what's really embedded into the guidelines and how to interpret this data yourself. So, again, I have shirts made on this. It's like, don't be a LexiComp pharmacist. Like, <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah. I mean, I, I even in my... LexiComp's just going to take you down. Oh, <laughs> They're going to come you're, after you. are done. <laughs> the, uh, it's like, even like when I'm doing lectures for the PA school, like, I've, I'm pretty open with them. Like, obviously... You know, you need to do well. You need to, you know, move on to the program. But I'm like, I have zero interest in how well you answer A, B, C, D. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that means not, like, can you take what you've applied and then does this information apply to the patient in front of you? 
right then and there. Mm-hmm. And like that's the I think that's people get so caught up on just like that the likes can't be answers of like the tech oh, you can't do that because in the textbook it says you can't. Like there's no exceptions ever. Yeah, it's like it's a twenty two point four percent chance of having a GI bleed. Like yeah, okay, nerd. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> and you bully him. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm yeah, just kidding. Mike does. <laughs> no, that's not true. But um no, I think that's good because I think that that's more you know, students need to think you know, through that, that concept and also take the time to, to dive deeper. Yeah. Ask yourself why. And it I, takes a certain level of comfort too, because you're yeah. comfortable within the lexicon recommendations and you feel like it's reasonably safe. And then you go outside of that and you're concerned that there might be dangerous, but yeah. after you've done it some and yeah. seen that they're, they don't die, then knowing how, to, yeah, knowing how to, when to deviate, it's right. important. And that's my thing is like for lexicon, don't sue me again. I'm not saying lexicon <laughs> is just a bad thing. I'm saying that lexicon pharmacist yeah. is, is the bad thing because I'm like, I have a final exam coming up for my students and they have to answer three questions, right? And it's an open book, open resource. And like, you have five minutes to answer this question. Nice. That's real life. Yeah. Like, I don't care how you do it. I just mm-hmm. care that you find a way to express the answer and understand how to explain it in like very simple terms. Like you can re- you can read what sepsis is. If you don't know what's going on, it's hard for you to, to actually dig deeper into all of the background. So right. I think that's my major thing is like, just don't be that person who just have rote memorization because it it doesn't necessarily save lives all the time. And I've had the four point student come to the ED and like cry when there's a patient in front of them because like none of that stuff matters anymore. Right. Yeah. Don't, don't even be started on that. <laughs> don't get my started on four point students. <laughs> You know, I had a four point oh in undergrad. Did you? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but don't worry, non farms. You you were very normal when you got to the farm. So <laughs> you were very because I, I just I'm I, you know, and some of them are great. It's not a blanket statement because you can't ever be cookie cutter. But I feel like a lot of times they get those students that do that well academically, academically just are so they're, like they're the blinders are focused, on. Yeah. yeah, and you know, I think sometimes you need Tunnel a little vision. unfocused. Yeah, <laughs> blinders. But um, Jimmy, man, do anything else that we need to talk about? Is that good? I mean, that's a solid summary. I'm- yeah, that really hit all the major points. Again, definitely read this. Shout out to all my ID colleagues who this guideline who really support you know antimicrobial stewardship, um, and really provides really good recommendations. Um, I would love for them to mention a uh, fluid balance over a long period of time versus the initial resuscitation. But outside of this, this is one of the most complete guidelines I've seen within the ED ICU area within the last few years. So this is a really good read and really good outline. And, you know, I, I, I'm just going to give it its praise while I can. Heck yeah. Great. That's Love awesome. It. So where can people find you? Oh, cool. Again, you guys can find me on Twitter. Again, form D underscore in the ED. That's where I have my big presence. And you guys mentioned before, I, I'm the, 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 the host of the Farm So Heart podcast. I have a few other things that's out there. Just go check out the podcast. Again, this is going to be a good argument. If you like inpatient, you can come out right. You want to go outpatient, you have a phenomenal resource where you're at right now. So I think it's a good compliment to, to stack these episodes up back to back with each other. We won't say phenomenal. We're at least <laughs> mediocre. It's average at best. Average at best. <laughs> but yeah, go check them out. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and thank you guys so much for listening. As always, um, you know, if you guys have any questions for Cole or myself, you know, the, our emails will be in the show notes. You can reach us at uh, Cole or Consult RX at any of the social media platforms. You can send me a text directly if you want at 415-943-6116. Um, also, make sure you check out the Patreon account if you want more like lecture style, um, traditional PowerPoint slide type of thing instead of our all over the place podcast episodes. Um, got a lot of content on there, about 100 lectures now. And so, um, you know, if, you hope you guys are enjoying that. I've had a few people now that say they've used it to pass the um, BCACP, which is pretty awesome. So we're, you I'll know, be taking that in a little bit. Are you? Yeah, Heck yeah. Year. That's awesome. I'm going to take a different one now. <laughs> you, you're done with that. <laughs> just, just for the heck of it. <laughs> Moving on. But um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Make sure you check out all that stuff. And, and above all, though, we appreciate the support as always. Thanks for still hanging in there and listening to us after all this time. And uh, we will catch you guys in the next one. Have a great one.